the best for the end. Uh-huh. <laughs> Ooh, la, la. Arthur, we, we don't introduce Arthur anymore. Everybody no. knows Arthur. If you don't. So, yes, please, anyway, Arthur. So just so we can understand where I am, uh, I've got 19 minutes on a Friday afternoon in Stockholm between you and cocktails. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> It's so great. I just love my life sometimes. Um, so what um, Corinne <laughs> has asked me to do is just to try to be observant through these past two days and try then to pull back the camera and share with you what I think we are actually learning and a broader context about maybe what it means. So um, I have some ideas. Oh. Wait, well, yeah. One second. One second. <laughs> I've got... 17 minutes. What do you think <laughs> okay. So what I want to share with you is something I whipped up about 20 minutes ago called One Frame and 10 Lessons from Stockholm. And the reason I want to start with the frame is because I don't think any conversations about topics as broad and uh, provocative as creativity, they don't have meaning unless they're contextualized. We have to know the universe within which we are having this conversation. What I've observed throughout the whole conversation is a ping-ponging between the two sides of our head, right? The creative side and the rational side. Because for all of the great enthusiasm we have about this notion of unbridled creativity, at the same time we're like, well, how do I sell that? How does that actually work? How does that actually yield some results? So what I do when I'm not sure about stuff like this is I go outside and I start with the audience. And that's what I mean by the frame, because I think Anything we do, including creativity, is ultimately only valuable if the audience feels it, right? Otherwise, we're just being nice to ourselves. So I think about this all the time. I believe that this is the definitional moment of this moment in time in museum going. I see it everywhere. You all have seen it, right? What is happening here? There is so much happening here, because you know that this is actually, on a meta level, an act of self-validation, right? What this guy is doing is having his friend take a picture on an iPhone, which probably before he goes into the next gallery, will be put up on a, a myriad of social websites, right? It's going to be on Instagram before he gets to the bathroom. He's going to post it on Facebook. He's going to tweet it. Why? Because he's telling the world something about himself because of this moment he's sharing next to, could it be more timeless, Aphrodite, next to something that is bigger than all of us, but on par with him at this moment. And I think we have to remember this, because sometimes we have very highfalutin ideas about what the actual motivations are for visitation and participation, and I think a lot of it right now is this. So what do we do with that? Well, one of the things I like to think about is creating what I call a frame for the audience experience. And that is to say that we are lying to ourselves whenever we use the term audience, right? However, I think we've also been kind of full of crap when we've tried to identify audiences based on demographic segmentation or life stage or where they live and all that stuff. How many times have we tortured ourselves in marketing plans by you know, slicing and dicing a million things? What I have come to believe is a variety of things. I've come to believe in presentations that have very few words. Um, I've come to believe that motivations are what unify and define audience behavior more than anything else. And that a motivation group can include someone who's 75 years old and lives in the city along with a 14-year-old girl who lives in the burbs. If what they're looking for in that particular museum experience is similar. So, these are the two twains, I think that we have to recognize this kind of ping-ponging back and forth between me and we-centered mentalities in the audience experience. And by that I mean, this is the big trend. And Jake expressed it perhaps more impressively and eloquently than perhaps you'll see anywhere else. But effectively that the evolution of technology, the continued spin of technology is awesome. I have as many gadgets as anybody does. but. What does it do? It creates an expectation of constant personalization. Our life is a mixtape. And museums on that mixtape are content providers. We are one track. 
How do you get selected to be in my favorite mixtape? Therefore, we have an expectation of constant ongoing personalization and customization, which is awesome. However, it's not the only thing that we are, only thing that we do. One of the things I really am grateful to Jake for in, in ending with that 9-11 presentation, which always makes me kind of suck in my gut, um, you know, with the emotional kind of caliber of it, is when we move to we, because I believe that equally strong is what we can call the counter trend. Simply put, with the more stuff we have, the more technology that creates interventions and layers around us, we still have a basic human need to physically, emotionally connect. And when I'm in focus groups with people who really had a great audience experience, they move there. That's what hammers home to me. They love this, and I'm not saying that this is better or worse, but what I'm saying is audiences are complex and at different moments have different needs, and we have to recognize that these mindsets sometimes create a different expectation of the role for the museum in their life. And sometimes they just want a happy space to chill out or to put their arm around someone or to be in the comfort of strangers. And that's equally valid. Um, there's this guy called John Falk. Does anyone know him? Yeah. yeah, he's awesome, right? So he's this researcher at the University of Washington, and he's created something called a, a motivation-based um, visitor typologies. There, there's five of these are his, and I added one. And I just grouped them into these two clusters. So in the me techno-driven mindset, you have people like the explorer, the person who is constantly seeking the new. And it is a very solitary pursuit, but also very gratifying for them. The professional, the kind of armchair curator who's coming to see you because they've been to every Egyptian exhibition ever and they want to see how yours stacks up. Also a solitary pursuit, also one in which technology and enhanced experiences play a major role. The spiritual pilgrim. Um, I sometimes show a photograph of a woman sitting in front of a Rothko in an empty gallery. That mythological moment that I think is increasingly um, aberrant, but it still happens. And that's someone who just wants to chill. They just want to unplug and disconnect. Very solitary mindset. Then you have these other roles, like the facilitator, that's mom or dad or your grandmother, who wants to define success by what they enable you to bring along or drag along to experience. So if you have a good time, they are happy. The experience seeker, you know, that's kind of the heat-seeking missile who's just checking off a list. It's probably that guy we just saw in the photograph. And the other one I would add, which is the cool hunter, which is a kind of subset of the experience seeker who does things because they are the coolest thing to do. And it doesn't matter what the art form is, it doesn't matter if they're walking into a museum or whether they're going to a concert hall or whether they're going to some kind of you know, new performance or anything. They're agnostic in terms of the specificity of the form. What they want is cool. And they get a lot of social capital out of being there first and experiencing it, so there's a kind of cyclicality because they might use technology then to share the coolness. So what I'm just suggesting here is as we think about engaging creativity, don't, you know, it's not about you. It's not about you getting off on feeling creative. And I don't mean to be dismissive about some of the great um, efforts, but it's about whether the kind of creative experience that you are delivering are in service to and recognizing the reality of what's in the audience's head and what their needs are, and whether those are kind of quasi-spiritual needs, or whether those are needs for um, a kind of social value, or they're intellectual. I mean, I personally believe, I use this kind of cheesy expression that in a museum world, you walk through the door of enjoyment to get to the portal of enlightenment, which just is a lot of bullshit for saying, you gotta have a good time first, right? Before you can have the moment that every curator thinks you're having, which is that, oh, that Zen experience and you have the Stendhal effect and we all faint, right? Before you can have that, you have to have the emotional connection. Did we lose him? Okay. And I believe that there is a hierarchy in this process, that you can lead to that moment that all the curators and the directors love, but you have to go through this point of connection first. So, what do I think, what have I heard? And I could be completely wrong and you may have heard different things. But again, I believe in pith, and so I like numbers. I like 10, people remember stuff. So here's what I think I've heard over the past two days. Open up. The best museums are, um, we use a model called the porous museum, the permeable museum. 
And there's a lot of different expressions of that. We've seen in some of the charts actually today, which were some amazing presentations, the notion that a museum is really now defined as an experience platform that can express itself physically or through technology or even through word of mouth or through um, its publications and the impact it has in the world through mediated experiences. But the better jobs are done by those museums who have this expansive definition of self that is not place-based. Which is not to say that amazing places aren't important. The spiritual pilgrim is looking for place, probably. But it does mean that to be able to offer the broadest range of experiences, you have to understand that you are a platform designed by a worldview, designed by what we'll get into in a moment, which is a particular slice of the world that can then be activated, accessed, and experienced through a variety of portals. So on a similar note, when the people I work with in museums, when they ask me their advice, just generally, how can they do things better, I say, get on a fucking plane. Get on a plane. Get in the car. Go see shit that's happening in the world, right? Go see stuff. There is so much, especially through technology, there are so many transplants from the non-museum world migrating their way into museums and vice versa. So ask what's cool. Ask your kid and go see it. So get out into the world and then think outside in. Why? Because this is the corrective way to balance, and corrective is kind of value judgment-y, so let's try to be agnostic. Let's just say that the presumption and the curatorial perspective is intentionally an inside-out perspective that starts with the object and pushes it out into the world, or not. Your job, if you're attending a conference called Communicating the Museum, I believe, is about starting outside and working in, winding up with the object or space or experience or program, and making sure, for example, if you use some of those typologies we saw at the beginning as an outline for a marketing plan, there's a cool idea, what kind of program implication does that have when you start outside and work backwards? I find it to be a much more dynamic and ultimately fruitful way of getting to awesome ideas. Share your voice. We heard this in many different ways. It was a very interesting conversation. I would have liked to hear more, but you know, we would with everything here that we heard yesterday um, about the tone of voice. But I think what's happening now is a kind of democratization and a plurality of voices now coming to define the museum's voice. Now, I will say at the same time that I worry about that, because guess what? Those voices are defined by a particular group of people at a particular point in the museum's history. So my question to you guys is, what's the museum's voice beyond the specific group of people who have collectively come together to express that voice at that moment? Sometimes it's a hard question to answer, but clearly people want to be a part of that process. And when the audience is transformed into evangelists on behalf of the museum because they feel empowered and invited to share their voice, it makes your voice better. Creating is awesome, but co-creating is better. Because we live in a co-created society. We live in a society where increasingly, that chart that you just saw on the left, our role as creators are to queue up an experience that then someone can take further. And that someone is typically the visitor. The tendency towards expectation, I'm sorry, the tendency towards co-creation will become an expectation if it has not already. I think that is the next generation of museum goers. They will walk into the museum expecting that there will be opportunities to co-create throughout. And whether that's co-curation, whether that's crowdsourcing on site, whether that's kind of long tail experiences where they can then reconnect with the museum after the physical experience and join virtual communities that you host, which is cool. That's all co-creating, and that is moving now from optional to mandatory. <coughs> I know it. Know your why. Uh, I think this goes back to Damien's point originally, and we've heard it echoed throughout, which is that purpose. I used to be brand guy too, and I'm really happy <laughs> that you're in the same place. We always used to be brand guys, right? But then I learned that, you know, brands, that word's aw awful because it's been corrupted and polluted, and directors hate it. And if I can't sell to a director and a board, it's not going to happen. But the why, this notion of purpose, and what is purpose? Let me give you a working definition. It is the intersection between that which you are most passionate about, most committed to, and that which the world will reward you for doing. 
It's supply and demand. Where those things overlap, that's where your purpose lies. And that's why sometimes when I see technology for technology's sake, I realize that you're only activating half of that purpose formula. You're only doing things because you can be generative. You're not doing things that are both generative and for which there is this great need in the world. So, and that's hard because no one knows what the need is until you put it out there and you see whether they respond to it or not. But it's essential. So the why or the purpose I think is fundamental to that. Tell me a story. Um, so here's my best definition of branding that I've ever read. Two words, organizational storytelling. That's it, right? I mean, all BS aside, that's what it is. Why? Because we're narrative. Humans are narrative based. After we have taken care of basic needs, you know, food, shelter, et cetera, sex, which you talked about today, this is session two, we tell stories of food, shelter, sex, and beyond. That is how we connect with each other. And the narrative impulse, I always, and I go back to the Rothko example, which is the difference between someone who's never been to a museum walking up, particularly in a contemporary art center, we work with a lot of them, and you stand in front of this thing and you're like, what the, you know, how do I get in? I feel stupid, I just paid you 15 bucks and now I feel stupid. You think I'm coming back? However, if you understand the moment the mindset of that artist and some narrative about the things that led to the expression that is manifest through that object, all of a sudden you connect. And it's story that does this. There's a great book, um, Daniel Pink, um, about story. I love that book. Um, there's uh, just this notion that the way we link to each other is ultimately narrative based and art is narrative made physical. We all have stories to tell, and you guys are really good storytellers. Um, everyone said this a million times, so I don't have to reiterate it, simply other than to say that failing is a step along the path, as Jake told us, to success. It's rather inevitable, too. I, very few of what I consider to be our company's greatest successes have not come at the expense of some real slips along the way. But your obligation is to not freak out, number one. Breathe, breathe, breathe. <laughs> and to learn from it, to understand what did I just learn? What was my presumption going in that wasn't delivered on that enables me now to do it better and do it successfully the next time around? So I believe this. Um, I'm not sure everyone will. But when I think about the theme of this conference, I think that what we're talking about is a means to an end, a vehicle or process. I think we get really hung up when we sanctify creativity as this holy noun, right? Oh, we want to nurture creativity as if, you know, it's the, this banquet or something like that. I think if instead, if we think about it, is I want to achieve this goal and I want to do it creatively, how is that different than other ways I could do it? What's the most creative approach I could take in service to a goal? The notion that it is a how and not a what. I think we can find that liberating because I think the notion of trying to uh, live under the pressure of creating creativity can freak you out and it can actually impede progress. I have seen that happen. And my final two points might be a little weird, but we know about this, but I just think it's true. I mean, I was going to say trust the universe, and I thought you'd all think, oh, another American woo-woo. <laughs> but I do think there is this notion <laughs> that we just have to big, do a big, you know, zen um once in a while, and just assume that even if in the short term we're going to slip, or we're going to fail, or the client's not going to like it or not going to get it, that we ultimately have to trust the people in the process that we're all trying to achieve something good, and they want the win. What I'm always struck with at this conference is how unified we all are as cultural professionals and how that is like a universal that transcends the specificity of our cultures. Because we're so committed to what we do and obviously we believe in it and obviously we could do other things in other ways. And this last point, <laughs> show some love. Um, there are many ways one can interpret it, especially after yesterday. But what I would suggest is simply this. What I'm really surprised by most, even when I see, as we saw today, um, that beautiful design presentation, I'm always surprised that museums don't try to leverage emotional connection. 
It's so weird to me. We always try to create, in a way, the most um, beautiful, objectified, clean, concise expression. But often, what we're really trying to get to is to tap into what I think is the ultimate bond between visitor and institution, which is an emotion-based bond. Yes, we want to be a design leader. Yes, we want to be you know, a scientific this and that. Yes, we want to be you know, this window into the world. But I think if we're going to have any chance of succeeding at doing that, we have to engage the emotion behind that first. <coughs> and we've actually created a few campaigns recently that have used the L word to varying degrees. I don't know if it's right, but I believe that it reflects an insight that museums have been uncomfortable with in the past. So those are my big 10, and as a kind of free 11th, I would simply say, just like at this conference, you are emissaries. Go out into the world and do as much as you can to take what you've learned here and share it with your colleagues who weren't fortunate enough to be in this room. Thank you. Are we done? Super. Super. Otherwise. Are we done? C'est complet? Almost, almost. Well, oui. Oui. thank you very much. This was a brilliant American woo woo. So I love how the French use the word brilliant <laughs> because it, you don't have to be brilliant to be called brilliant by a French person. I love that. No, <laughs> so we always <laughs> émerveillé. You understand oui, émerveillé? Oui, émerveillé with accent uh, aigu. Oui, oui. aigu. <laughs> So I think it was really interesting to end with, uh, with Arthur. This conference has been really interesting. I mean, uh, the, the, the theme of creativity was quite uh, challenging to start with. We were a little uh, nervous about, uh, you know, it's, it's a big subject. But at the end, as you say, it was really interesting to, 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 to see how many people share, were very honest with their experiences, with their work they have done and, and being here in Stockholm was, was a really a, 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 a special a great treat and, uh, and it was really great to be with, with you all.